Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, Executive Director of the Government Accountability Project. In just a few minutes, a conversation with a woman whose own experience blowing the whistle has led her on a lifelong mission to assist others who put at risk their careers and reputations to do the right thing. But first, the economic meltdown has brought into sharp relief just how complex and fragile the global web of financial markets really is and how governments have lacked either the will or capacity to effectively regulate these markets. One seeming no-brainer would be to incentivize insiders in financial institutions to blow the whistle on wrongdoing. But is that what we're doing? Let's learn more from Jack Blum, a money laundering expert and the chair of the Tax Justice Network, and Jesslyn Radak, Homeland Security Director of the Government Accountability Project. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Jack, let's start with you. You've been tracking international money flows for a long time now. Is there a regulatory mechanism that effectively tracks uh, private capital flow around the world? There isn't really. Uh, you can get information from individual governments when they provide it, if they provide it, and there are numbers of governments that very carefully omit providing significant information. But the idea of the rich parking their excess money in tax havens is nothing new, is it? Uh, it's been going on for a long time. What's new is how easy it became because of the web and because of the uh, extraordinary sales efforts of large numbers of international financial institutions. Describe the machinations of somebody who's trying to secrete money somewhere in uh, some offshore or tax haven uh, location? It, it typically doesn't require a lot of machination by the individual. Uh, there are salespeople for these different banks, some of them, as we know from the UBS case, who apply the U.S. Uh, rather vigorously looking for customers. And once they find a customer, they set up all the necessary machinery to move the money out of the country and hide it offshore. Uh, UBS got caught, and we saw the machinery in operation. Uh, they held uh, these events, uh, boat yacht races, art festivals, and they would bring their salesmen there to co uh, connect with very rich people. UBS being a Swiss bank, and uh, they recently struck a deal, Jess, with the uh, IRS and Justice Department, is that right, uh, uh, regarding uh, turning over the names of American depositors uh, in the bank. Uh, these Swiss banks like UBS have anonymous C, uh, numbered bank accounts typically. Is that a good deal? Um, I wouldn't call that plea any sort of bargain. I think in the criminal case, they paid a $780 million penalty, which is really underfined compared to how much uh, ill-gotten gains they received during the course of this. And in terms of the name, settling for 4,500 names when you originally thought 52,000. I don't think settling for fewer than 10% is a good deal. And the idea was that simply by settling for the 4,500 names, but they were unknown to those depositors that others would come forward because they didn't want to get caught not coming forward. Right. The, there was a tax amnesty program set up, and it was really interesting that the Justice Department would actually use that word in the state program to try to get people to self-report. Um, and a number of people did come forward, but it was Russian roulette in terms of people who had offshore Swiss bank accounts on whether or not to disclose. So of the 52,000 minus how many ever came forward, somewhere between 3,000 and 7,000, that many people are still running around with no penalty or consequence whatsoever. And do we have any idea how much money is involved in these uh, 52,000 accounts? Yes, in the hearings, UBS itself said we were talking about $20 billion in assets on which they were earning fees of $200 million a year. And the irony of all of this is, uh, yes, uh, they made more money over the number of years involved than they paid in fines. So they were net ahead on having run this business. 
The further irony is the amnesty was so set up so that it only looked back six years, so that if some of these customers had been doing it for 20 years and had never paid tax on the money originally earned that went into the account, they came out net ahead after paying penalties, interest, and taxes on the past six years. Just what led uh, the IRS to UBS? Well, according to both the IRS and the Justice Department, um, a, a whistleblower named Bradley Birkenfeld, who had been a UBS banker, was the entire reason they had any case whatsoever against UBS. He had been a banker with UBS for about four or five years. He complained internally through UBS's whistleblower policy about the problems and they did a sham investigation and he then came forward voluntarily to various different federal agencies including both Congress, Justice Department, IRS, and SEC. Now he isn't somebody with clean hands himself, is he? He acknowledges smuggling diamonds in toothpaste tubes across the uh, ocean on behalf of clients. So. Um, Shouldn't he pay a price? Yeah, he, he pled guilty to one count of fraud conspiracy and I, has been paying a price on home arrest for the past year and a half. Um, for unknown reasons, the Justice Department delayed his sentencing four times and even once sentenced, delayed it again because they wanted his further cooperation, although he's reached out and they haven't wanted to speak with him. And so what about the other people who were involved in this scheme at UBS? As far as I can tell, everyone has gone scot-free. Martin Lischke, who was a UBS kingpin, is back in Switzerland. He was actually here in U.S. detention for four months, pled the fifth in front of the Senate, and then was released back to Switzerland. His boss, Raoul Weil, um, I believe has been convicted or at least indicted and is a fugitive from justice back in Switzerland or Liechtenstein. Um, all the other major players at UBS have suffered no consequence. Because of the settlement you mentioned earlier, the bank itself has avoided criminal liability. And so far, in terms of UBS clients who have been sentenced, nobody has been sentenced to jail but for the whistleblower, Bradley Birkenfeld, who's an American. Now, the, the really surprising part of this story is that while all of this was going on, the Federal Reserve bailed out UBS. UBS was in the hole $86 billion on bad dealing in U.S. mortgage-backed securities. Uh, UBS went to the Swiss National Bank and said, unless we get a big pile of money, in this case, the, uh, I think it was about $50 billion or more, we're out of business. The Swiss then came to the Fed and said, we need dollars to take care of UBS's problem. And the Fed said, no problem, we'll give you a swap line unlimited at uh, the current exchange rate. And that bailed out UBS no conditions, no turnover of 52,000 names. It's here we are, one central bank to another. At the minimum, they should have said 52,000 names or you guys can go to the dustbin of banking history. Uh, the whistleblower uh, suit that Birkenfeld would like to prevail under is uh, related to the IRS, Jess. Tell me about this law and how does it work? It's not actually a suit that he's brought. The IRS passed a law in 2006 to incentivize whistleblowers to come forward. And it functions much like a parallel QUITAM law in which it provides a reward of any proceeds the government reaps as a result of the information the whistleblower brought forward. So when Birkenfeld first started talking with the US, he filled out the one-page form 211, I believe, um, claiming himself to be a whistleblower under the IRS program. Uh, recently, he retained new counsel. He wasn't represented on that issue. And he has now filed or supplemented his original claim with a new filing. Uh, I mean, he's been sentenced to more than three years in jail, so he, it seems he should at least get the reward which would be a portion of the $780 million that the U.S. has recouped. Has this uh, IRS provision been used before? 
I don't know if other people have filed applications, but since the office went into effect in 2006, it has never paid out an award. And Jack, what do you think the effect of the decision of prosecuting only, uh, in jailing only Bradley Birkenfeld will be on the incentives to come forward? Well, this, this is a, a serious question from this perspective. I don't object to the jailing of Birkenfeld because clearly he was in this business for quite a while before he found the conscience and he handled a lot of money for a lot of rich people and as you said smuggled diamonds which is a pretty good index that he wasn't exactly uh, one of nature's noblemen. On the other hand, uh, a number of the people who were caught in the UBS case for not paying taxes have gotten off with uh, home sentences and uh, rather light touch treatment and the question really is should they? Uh, these are people who, in my judgment, deserve uh, much harsher sentences. Uh, there's a second issue, and that's on the whistleblower money. Congress passed the law, but IRS put it in charge of an office in Buffalo, New York, that has been run by lower-level uh, civil servants who seem terrified at the thought of actually rewarding people who have uh, given up information. So in at least two other cases that I'm involved in, where there's no question of criminal behavior in the United States on the part of uh, the person who blew the whistle, they still haven't come up with the money even though they've collected tens of millions. And so what needs to be done legislatively to fix this? The, the law is there. It's what needs to be done by Congress to kick the mule and make it do what the law says. So it's a problem in how the IRS is running the office and Congress needs more oversight of that? Congress needs much more oversight. Uh, they need to really ask some hard questions. Among, among other things, in the proposed regs on the office, they're saying that if any of the materials that were used in informing IRS were obtained illegally, uh, they won't pay the reward. So the question then becomes, how do you give information about an individual or an employer uh, who has violated the tax law without violating some other law? Uh, and uh, that question hasn't been uh, answered. And uh, they, they're still struggling with it. So in other words, if I take payroll records that show somebody's cheating on tax, and my employer says those records were stolen, does that mean no reward? And if they assume that, it'll mean nobody ever collects. Well, I wanted to respond to something Jack said. Um, I have met Bradley Birkenfeld, and I do find him to be of strong moral character. He came forward. He's the only one who came forward. The DOJ actually had, the Department of Justice had Martin Leishty in its claws back in 2005 and didn't make a case. And Birkenfeld, it wasn't like he sat around doing this for years, reaping the benefits. I mean, he blew the whistle when he found a document on UBS's computers that contradicted what they were being trained and incentivized to do. And he blew the whistle internally immediately. And you have to keep in mind that what he was doing in Switzerland is legal. But to the extent that UBS set up a program in the Americas, ranging from Canada all the way down to Argentina, and started doing this, that was what the problem was. And Birkenfeld found something, an internal UBS document that conflicted with what he was being told to do. And what was the conflict? The conflict was in terms of actually how, how he should go about and how much to recruit. Some of what mm -hmm. Jack was talking about earlier recruiting clients. So are we okay then with the state of the law? Is, is the law itself generally okay in terms of chasing after uh, tax havens and, and money launderers and people parking their uh, excess revenues to hide from taxes, Jack? I think the, the problem is uh, enforcement, enforcement tools, and where we go from here. Uh, the office that provides the rewards has to be cleaned up, uh, but then IRS needs more manpower, more trained people, uh, and a greater capacity to really go after the people who've been cheating who they find out about. I agree. I think the law is a good one, um, but the way it's being played out right now, it ends up ser serving kind of as a perverse tool of entrapment 
because unlike usual whistleblower protection laws, this is actually a whistleblower incentive law that, that encourages and ropes people into coming forward and then to turn around and slam them and send them to prison sends a really chilling message. And I've already had other potential financial whistleblower client, clients on the offshore tax haven issue who have not gone forward because they see what happened to Bradley Birkenfeld. Well, many thanks to GAP's Jesslyn Radak and Tax Justice Network's Jack Blum for helping us better understand the complexities of the global financial system and how we might better regulate and enforce that system for the common good.